good morning, you Westalians, and uh, it's uh, good back, good to be back and uh, uh, be uh, filling in uh, for uh, for Reverend Linda. And uh, I hope you've uh, enjoyed uh, getting to know uh, Linda a little bit. And uh, and uh, we started this new year on a uh, a new pathway. And so it's great to have you uh, back here and. Uh, and those of you who are watching from the community, it's always a pleasure to realize that a number of you folks uh, turn into Westdale's uh, worship service on YouTube. And so we're glad to have you as well and hope you uh, find it meaningful to be part of our worship service. <clears throat> we'll start with the lighting of the Christ candle. The Lord said, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Lord, we may not be physically gathered here in this place today, but may the light of this candle indicate that we are together in spirit, heart, and mind as we bring praise and thanksgiving in your name. Amen. Let us continue with our call to worship. Why do we come together to worship? To worship our God. By the, whose authority do we gather? In the name of Jesus, our teacher. How do we worship? By listening for Jesus' voice, by hearing the good news, by singing and praying. Also, by telling stories of God's love for all people and by sharing that love with neighbors near and far. Come, let us praise God together. Amen. Our opening prayer together as we say, O oh God, your word has called us to worship as part of this community of faith. You have beckoned us to follow Jesus, who speaks and acts with a new kind of authority. This authority is more about peace than power, more about love and liberation than domination. Through him, you open us to new ways of seeing and responding. Bless us as we seek understanding this day. Amen. Our opening hymn today is from Voices United 395. Come in, come in, and sit down. Verses 1, 2, and 3.
Well, hello kids. Uh, it's been a long time actually since I've uh, been able to speak with you. And we got something new going on this week, haven't we? You're all back at school. And those of you who are in school are, uh, uh, or maybe some of you are still doing schooling online. But uh, for the most part, I suspect a number of you are back into your uh, classrooms with your teacher and fellow students. I want to tell you a little bit about me and going to school. Um, you know, uh, when I was in high school, uh, I used to take subjects like math and science and um, English and all of those kinds of subjects. But the high school I went to also taught all of the, the trades. Now, what I mean by that is like how to be a good carpenter and how to be a good auto uh, repair man and how to be an electrician. And I, uh, I had a lot of uh, classes in those kinds of things to build up my skills about how to be a really handy person and fix things. And, um, and, and I have brought my toolbox along today because uh, I want to show you this is the extent of, of most of the tools I have, which uh, you can see it really isn't very much. I have a hammer and um, I have a, um, a set of pliers and I have a, a screwdriver and I have a wrench and um you but you know what the most things the most i use uh, all the time when i'm trying to fix something is duct tape and um my wife calls me the duct tape king if i'm trying to fix anything i use duct tape now the problem is i don't fix things very well anytime and uh and fortunately um, my wife and I know people who really do know how to fix things. Um, they are their authorities uh, on how to fix uh, a broken sink or how to um, fix um, a, a shelf that's broken or something like that. Uh, they really have the skills and they know what they're talking about. And they, they have all the authority that I'm comfortable with knowing that they're going to fix things. And, um, and they actually, by the time they fix things, they've taught me uh, how to fix things a little bit better on my own. Well, the story today in the Bible that we're going to read is about somebody who teaches with authority. It's the story of Jesus teaching in a synagogue who has the authority that people will respect. They will they'll listen to uh, what he has to say. You know, the best teachers are those people who know what they're talking about. They know what the job is or what the topic is. Now, I suspect that your school, there are some times when you look at your teacher and they're telling you something and you're saying, hmm, I'm not sure what this is all about. Or there are other times and you say, yeah, I get it. My teacher really knows an awful lot about that. They're a good teacher because they have this sense of giving to you what it is they know really well. Well, Jesus was a great teacher. In fact, he was probably seen as the best teacher about somebody who teaches about love. In the Bible story today, we're going to hear about Jesus teaching to people in a synagogue in his time. And he teaches about love and, and the, the reason why his work on on earth is so important to spread that sense of love and forgiveness and compassion 
that God wanted him to do. Jesus is the best teacher when you want to find out about love. And so when we come and you come back to Westdale and we have lessons and so on with Tanya and uh, in the kids club, one of the things that we want to continue to do is to remind you that the best teacher in terms of learning about love is Jesus. And if they, ha uh, Jesus doesn't use duct tape. Jesus uses the real thing. He, he uses how we get together with people and how we treat people and show what real love is all about. And so the lesson from today's Bible reading is going to be about teaching with authority or teaching as if you really know what it is you're talking about. And Jesus really knows what he's talking about. We'll talk to you again soon. Well, let us continue with the prayer of illumination. Open our ears, O God, that we may hear your word proclaimed this day. Open our minds and hearts to be changed. Free us from the unclean spirits of worry, fear, destruction, and pride. Teach us, Lord, that we may follow you more faithfully. Our scripture text today is from Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus sternly said. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Amen. Our anthem today is Walk in Light.
um, today uh, we're uh, we're really trying something uh, different uh, with the help of uh, our creative uh, uh, filmer and editor Tom Keaton. Um, we're actually going to try and do a sermon in front of a green screen, and uh, so that's why you're going to see uh, me standing here like this uh, throughout the sermon, and uh, and in fact I may be just moving a bit across. Uh, across the screen so I hope uh, hope this works and uh, the message is um, as, uh, as, as important as it uh, always is. Um, I suspect there are many of you who uh, years ago uh, would have remembered a, a real popular commercial that was uh, that was on television. Uh, it always uh, came on uh, uh, when uh, maybe in the uh, business reports of, of a television newscast or something. And it was a commercial that said, e when E.F. Hutton speaks, dot, 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 everybody listens. Well, the sermon today from the scripture text we read in Mark chapter 1 basically is something like that. When Jesus speaks, everybody listened. And in fact, when Jesus spoke, they were extremely surprised at how he said what he said. And so today we're going to kind of follow the pathway of, of um, entering into this story, this passageway into Capernaum. On this next uh, slide that you see here, you'll see the map of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the time when Jesus uh, actually moved to Capernaum. And, uh, and I've always found it interesting in my own mind, just where are these places? And, and some of them really still exist in the, in the location that they did then. Um, down below, uh, uh, Capernaum is at the top end of the, the Sea of Galilee, a little spot up here, and, and down further below uh, in this area of, of, the, uh, of the scriptural uh, time of the land uh, it was Jerusalem. And, and even uh, between Jerusalem and Capernaum, uh, there was uh, uh, Nazareth. And, and so you kind of get a sense of the locations of how, um, how it, it worked. Uh, and just above uh, the Jerusalem uh, was Bethlehem. And so where Jesus was born still exists in a spot. And, and then it, 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 it kind of shows you how uh, the passageway of Jesus' life took him to this, this more northern uh, spot. It's uh, not too far away from, uh, from the Mediterranean Sea. And, and, and why, uh, why, why he settled in Capernaum, which was a quiet uh, um, fishing village, was because it basically was a spot where uh, all of the travelers went through. It was kind of like a, a railway hub, but no railways uh, in those times. But, but people passed through Capernaum uh, en route to other places. And Jesus found that very, very useful in the sense of being able to um, uh, talk to people about uh, what his uh, mission was all about. And so I find it really interesting when you geographically locate uh, where the story took place. In fact, Jesus spent so much time in Capernaum uh, that in this slide you see that they've actually erected a sign that says, uh, this is the town of Jesus. Capernaum is the town of Jesus. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, even to this day, that sign exists and, uh, and visitors to that area would uh, find that sign uh, in place as well. And so it's, uh, it's become the crossroads, as I say, of uh, where uh, Jesus uh, was able to travel to a number of other smaller, smaller uh, fishing villages uh, to do his, uh, his teaching and, and uh, sharing uh, what he had to say. 
Well, in Capernaum, he stayed there, and when he first got there, in this slide, you'll see the ruins of the synagogue uh, in which uh, he uh, spoke. Um, and in fact, the ruins continue to be there uh, uh, to this day. In this, uh, in this synagogue, uh, it was uh, destroyed a number of times, uh, partially and, in, and almost completely by earthquakes. And, uh, and it had been, uh, even into the 17th and 18th century, uh, people were attempting to rebuild it uh, according to what they felt it was from the very beginning. And so this is where the story that we read today in Mark chapter 1 really starts. It's a story where Jesus, in fact, starts to uh, teach. Um, he comes into uh, the synagogue uh, on the Sabbath uh, uh, after arriving in Capernaum. And, uh, and he uh, begins to uh, take his spot in the, in the lecture uh, area of, of the synagogue with the people all gathered around and he begins to speak and and talk about uh, what he uh, what his message is all about immediately if you can see uh, the detail in this particular picture the people started to turn around and look at each other and they they kind of looked at each other with amazement saying man what is this person talking about look at the, how he's talking and what they began to see as we read in the scripture was they were astonished by the authority by which he spoke it was the authority by which jesus spoke he wasn't just one of the scribes you see in the synagogue it was quite regular a place for people to uh to come and speak and teach uh, some lessons uh, from the Torah. And they would refer to, uh, well, Rabbi so-and-so said this about that, and Rabbi so-and-so said this about that. And they would always make reference to somebody else speaking uh, what it was they were trying to share. What was so different was, that Jesus didn't speak like the scribes. He spoke with authority. He didn't have to say, Rabbi, so-and-so said this. He said, basically, I say, this is what it is. It was the authority that he exuded from his own experiences and from what he had learned that he wanted to share. That was the difference. When Jesus spoke, they really started to listen. In the midst of all of this, with everybody there, as you can see here, one gentleman stood up and started to confront Jesus. And he was kind of uh, very agitated um, some would suggest that he was maybe filled with the spirit or filled with a demon. And he was saying, I know who you are, Jesus. What are you having to do with us? What are you going to do? If you come here to destroy us? Basically, the answer, although we don't read it in this particular scripture text, is Jesus would have said, yes, I have. I've come here to take the evil out of people because that's part of my mission. In any case, he was not perturbed by the uh, disruption that this man caused in the midst of all of the people sitting in the synagogue. Jesus simply approached him and said, come out, evil spirit, come out of this man. And in that moment, the man shook and almost convulsed. And it is reported in our scripture stories in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where, where reference is often made to the same story, that, that 
It was a violent kind of coming out. The evil spirit was drawn out of him through Jesus' command. Well, it's been referred to as exorcism, but I'm not going to go into that today as one of the highlights of, of this particular lesson. But you can imagine what the people in the synagogue would have thought when they saw this happen. They would have seen that this man all of a sudden was quiet and settled down and the evil spirit appeared to have been drawn out of him. And again, the listeners said, what is it? What is it about the authority of this person, Jesus, that can draw evil spirits out of somebody? The power of being able to do that was so important for them to observe. And as the scripture text ends, this came to the conclusion of Jesus speaking in the synagogue that day as people began to leave and, and spread the word of what it was they had seen. And so what can we take from that? You see, Jesus really, he drew that spirit out and, and what he was really trying to do was to, to show how healing can take place. He wasn't trying to be mean or rough or violent with the man. He basically wanted to heal him and, and to bring him into a wholeness that he hadn't experienced in his life before. And that's one of the overall reasons that I think we have to look at this particular scripture text. Jesus' intent is to bring wholeness to those who listen to him. You know, I was so tempted to go into a long dissertation today about uh, the truth of what uh, Jesus says as opposed to our present day culture and and immediately past experience in North America with the, the very popular term, fake news. And I thought if I got into that little, uh, that little story of fake news, I'd be going down a rabbit hole that I wouldn't be able to get out of very easily because it becomes so predominant in people's thinking. What is the truth? I mean, there was a reporter who's made a, an absolute uh, living out of doing nothing but fact-checking. checking, And I didn't think that that was something that we needed to get into today. Because you don't need to fact-check what Jesus says. What Jesus says is the truth. It's the divine authority given by God as to what Jesus is saying. Jesus is talking about love and compassion and forgiveness. And he doesn't have to make reference to somebody else describing what that's all about. The truth is that that divine authority is part of what Jesus gives to us as well. Oh, when we speak and, and we try to share our our understanding of our faith with others and, and try to share a, a sense of love and compassion as followers of Christ. Certainly we will make reference, I'm sure, as I do regularly and, and uh, possibly uh, Reverend uh, Linda does as well, make reference to, to others what they have said. But Jesus has our back in that. The authority that we have to be open about our love uh, for others and, and the Christian sense of, of uh, giving that uh, freely to people uh, who uh, seem to be less needing it or wanting it. Jesus is the sense of truth without reference to any other human entity. And so this lesson today is one that is really interesting. 
it's at the beginning point where where Jesus, yes, does this real sense of a miracle by bringing the evil spirit out of out of a man in the presence of of uh, the synagogue and the parishioners. Wouldn't it be interesting what what kind of uh, reaction there would be in the sanctuary here at Westdale United Church if somebody got up and started a question, what are you all about? We certainly would have something to share with our neighbors if something like that happened. But in terms of the message that Jesus has for us today is when Jesus speaks, we should listen. And we need to listen to all that he has to say. I have a friend, and uh, his name is David, actually. And David tells me that he's a spiritual person. And he reads quite a bit. And he looks around at different things that are happening in church life, and even in looking at what happens in a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue, or a, a temple. And what he's often telling me are the bits and pieces he likes about this or that or something else that adds to his sense of spirituality. Well, I keep telling David that, you know, you just can't pick it out like it's a cafeteria style religion or cafeteria style faith. One of the things we need to understand is we take what Jesus has to say in whole, the whole thing. You can't have a strong faith and have an approach to what I would call Jesus light. That's not what this is all about. And so from the lessons today, I think it's really important for us to realize we were charged with carrying God's work forward. And we can do that if we listen to Jesus and realize he is the authority overall. Amen. Our response of him today is from Voices United, number 375. Spirit, spirit of gentleness, verses 1, 2, and 3.
let us continue with the prayers of the people followed by the Lord's Prayer. With our whole hearts, we praise you, Lord. We gather as people who come to confess and to seek your redemption, as people who gather in spirit to learn more of your mighty works and of your faithfulness and of your grace. All glory belongs to you, God. You are gracious and compassionate. You provide us all that we need, remembering your promise to hear when we call, to answer when we knock, and to reveal yourself when we seek you. You have revealed your power to us in so many ways. You heal the sick. You calm the frightened. You bring peace to the grieving. You change the course of our lives. We ask that you reveal your power today, especially for those we know who may not feel like their illnesses are not necessarily being healed or that their emotional, psychological, or spiritual challenges are being resolved so that they can feel the wholeness to be found in your love and compassion. So Lord, we lift these names to you. But to you, dear God, to, they are much more than names. They are your precious children. They are parents who are sick, maybe sisters and brothers, wives or husbands, friends or neighbors. They are yours. You know every detail, detail of their lives far better than we do. And so, Lord, we trust you with our prayers this day, not only because we know you have the power to answer, but because we have seen that you are faithful and just. And we know that the peace that passes all understanding dwells in you this day and forevermore. Dear God, through your Son, you have redeemed your people, and in your time, we pray you will redeem the whole world. And until then, we wait. But Lord, in the meantime, please help us not to spend our days just looking up in the sky. Send your Spirit that we might see the world as you do, and fill us with your compassion for those in need of shelter, of a friend, or of an advocate. Send us to the brokenhearted, the discarded, and those who are hungry for the transformation only you can bring. While our hearts cry, <clears throat> come Lord Jesus, let our hands reveal your presence in this world, a world so desperately in need of a renewed foundation of hope, joy, and love. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> well, at this time, when we approach our time of speaking to our uh, offering uh, invitation, um, I, uh, I thought that I would just do something just a little bit different as an introduction. I have a little bit of a story to tell you. A certain minister stood before his congregation one Sunday morning and said, I have some uh, bad news, I have some good news, and I have some more bad news. Well, the congregation fell silent. The bad news is that the church is going to need a new roof, the minister said. Well, the congregation, they just groaned. The good news is, 
we have enough money for the new roof. Oh, a sigh of relief fell upon the congregation. The bad news is, it's still in your bank account. <laughs> Tom will have me. <laughs> Let me just comment a bit about uh, why I just want to take this tact today about our offering. There's been a few things uh, that I think need to be said because uh, for the past number of weeks, Reverend, before Reverend Bev retired and, and now with uh, Reverend Linda, we're trying to comment and encourage people to be regular on their offering. And I get a chance to speak with our treasurer on a fairly regular basis. And, uh, and one of the things that we just simply want people to realize consistently is that uh, as congregation, as a congregation, our offering is really important to be kind of regular because as, uh, as the, uh, the in and out of uh, funds and, uh, go in a church, it's just like everything else. Uh, when, uh, when the bills come in, uh, they need to be paid. And, and so uh, consistent uh, uh, looking after our offerings is, is really important. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, the other side of, a, of some of the things that I just want to share with you, as somebody who sits in uh, the pews uh, almost uh, all of the time, not all the time, but as you know, much of the time with you, um, I, I speak from that point of view as well, um, that uh, it's really important that we, we continue to give what we can give uh, for the ongoing uh, care of the church. Uh, even though we all can't be here. Um, uh, a couple of comments I would make. There have been people who still think that because we have this uh, uh, sale of a piece of land, that we're going to have a lot of money and that we don't really need to worry about giving more offering. Uh, well, that's not quite true because the money that we get from the land has to be used for mission work of our church here at Westdale. Um, there's only a very, very small portion of the money from the sale of the land that we actually can use to pay bills and do things like that on a regular basis. So that it's, a, it's a misunderstanding to think that because we've sold the land and, and a fairly large amount of money will come our, our way, uh, that we can use that money. That's, that's not the way it works. And the other thing that I would certainly encourage uh, my fellow Westalians to realize is that um, the stability of our financial situation is so important as we are particularly in, the, in the, the mode of looking for a new minister. A new minister who wants to come to Westdale also wants to know that uh, there is a financial stability uh, that will uh, continue to uh, provide for him or her uh, if they uh, were to approach us and, and look for a call uh, to our uh, faith community. And so that's a really important additional reason why uh, we keep speaking about uh, being uh, consistent about our offerings. And so with those comments, I'll just leave it there and, and uh, hopefully you will take uh, those uh, comments to heart. And so let us pray. Loving God, you are never far from us. You are as close as our breathing. We recognize you as the one who heals the wounded spirit and gives new life to the brokenhearted. We offer these gifts to you, O God, as a sign of our commitment to your grace and authority. Take us and use us and all that we have so that the kingdom of heaven will be realized here on earth through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn today is Voices United 372, Though I May Speak, verses 1, 2, and 3.
Well, as we get to uh, our sending out, um, it's been certainly, uh, again, a pleasure for me to fill in for uh, Reverend Linda, and uh, I will be doing so uh, periodically as the months uh, transpire. But I want to uh, thank you for being with us this morning, particularly those of you who may not necessarily be members of Westdale United Church, but we're encouraged if you are in fact looking in and enjoying, we hope, uh, the worship service here. And so, may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us his peace. Hi. Hope you all had a great week. Well, we got into some trouble last week. We only had pictures of dogs. Now everyone is sending us pictures of cats. So if you could forward any photos that you might have of your little kitties to the email below, that would be much appreciated. Bye for now.